as a young lawmaker, how would you like to contribute towards a more united Sri Lanka? Well, I always believe in the theory of country before God. Mm -hmm. But I don't think many people can proudly say they're Sri Lankan. You go out, people say, I'm Sinhala Buddhist, I'm Tamil. Mm -hmm. And even in Tamils, I'm, I'm Jaffna Tamil, I'm Hill Upcountry Tamil, I'm a Muslim, I'm a burger, I'm a whatever. But at the end of the day, you need to have that feeling that I'm Sri Lankan. Mm -hmm. well, the only message I would like to give to the audience, especially considering that you, know, you have a large number of youth following as well, is that, you know, I think, you know, instead of sitting and pointing fingers saying the country is wrong because of this person and that person, we can take a step forward, you know, and make this country a better place one step at a time. You know, we don't have to be in the parliament, we don't have to be in positions of power. Mm -hmm. Every small act of kindness leads to a better Sri Lanka. Welcome everyone, you're watching Conversations with Alanki. And in today's episode, I will be in conversation with the State Minister of Estate, Housing and Community Infrastructure and the General Secretary of the Salon Workers Congress, Jeevan Thondeman. Welcome. Thank you for agreeing to have this conversation. I thought we would first speak about your entry into politics at a rather young age. You spent most of your childhood abroad and you pursued your law degree. What was your entry into politics like? Did you always aspire to be a politician? Well, I personally believe that nobody aspires to be a politician. It is something that is thrust upon you and uh, you have to do due diligence to it. To be more specific, I did study abroad and the reason for that being, you know, during the war, being the son of a cabinet minister, it was not the safest place to be in Sri Lanka. And um, studying abroad ironically became my biggest strength because, you know, I was exposed to a, you know, a lot of things, different cultures, different people. And, um, you know, when I came back here, I took over as the Deputy General Secretary of the Ceylon Workers' Congress. And following a year, I resigned and took over as the Youth Wing General Secretary. So before how it worked in uh, country politics is that Youth Wing, when people say that, it's immediately, you know, a bunch of young people getting into fights and getting into police cases and whatnot. And uh, when I took over as Youth Wing General Secretary, we changed it into a more welfare-based organization. So, um, yeah, so that was my entry into politics. And you did say that no one really aspires to be a politician. Um, there's a great deal you must have learned about politics from your father. But um, what I feel is that perhaps a great responsibility was cast on your shoulders when your father suddenly and unex unexpectedly passed away. Um, how do you find politics in Sri Lanka? Do you find it challenging? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, if you look at politics in Sri Lanka, it's it's slowly evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, it's evolving towards a better Sri Lanka, in my opinion. You know, there are more young parliamentarians in now. However, the number of women parliamentarians is yet to rise. Right. And, um, you know, it's evolving and we are, you know, going towards a better Sri Lanka. But, you know, there are certain challenges, I must say. You know, uh, for example, we come from a constituency where our main fight is not with the government, nor is it with other political parties, but it is with the companies and the RPCs. You know, um, we are mainly against the, the exploitation of the workers. So uh, these are the practical challenges that we face, nothing political. Though. Moving on to a different question. There are many plantation workers who live um, at a subsistence level. Um, and many of them work for long hours and in return, they're not really paid. Um, they're not really paid much. And there was a, if I remember correctly, there was an election promise made for 1,000 rupees to be paid. Has this been implemented? Well, um, you know, I think this is something I need to explain rather mm -hmm. detail. So, um, you know, as everyone is aware, estate workers or the estate working community, they came to this country 157, 58 years ago. And, you know, when they came into the country, we came in as modern day slaves. And, you know, as time went on, the CWC fought and we got um, you know, citizenship rights for them under the J.R. Jevatan regime. But following which, what many people are not aware is, uh, you know, the level of exploitation made done by the companies. You know, because I have noticed being a, being a young parliamentarian, being a young trade union leader, at the same time, looking at things from a third perspective, I have noticed the bad rapport uh, trade unions get, you know, especially with the urban crowd. You know, I have I've had so many of my own friends in uh, Colombo who have accused trade unions of exploiting the workers, but that is not reality. Because if we were the ones who were exploiting the workers, the workers would not be standing by us after 82 years. 
and that is something everyone needs to think about. It is just that you know uh, nobody from the trade union side had ventured into convincing anyone in the urban side, you know, such as coming to an interview, you know, um, which deals predominantly with the urban side. And you know, we have never exposed ourselves really. For example, recently um, I came across a news article in a paper where there was a individual who was speaking on behalf of the plantation companies. And he had mentioned that the companies had built 39,000 houses for their state workers. And that is something which was amusing to me because with whose money did they build the 39,000 houses? It was the money of the government. Namely, three former ministers who, are, who have all passed away. Uh, mainly, it was the late Saumya Murthy Tondaman, the late Armagam Tondaman and the late Chandra Shekhar. These three ministers together had built 39,000 houses for these estate workers over a course of time. And, you know, and how it is being portrayed is that the companies are the ones who have built these houses. And apart from that, if you look at it during the colonial era, the colonial masters such were the ones who built the roads, the hospitals, the crutches. The crutches are what we would call the childhood, child development uh, care centers, you know, and uh, hospitals and everything was built by the people who owned their states. They looked after their workers, whatever said and done. But post-independence and especially post privatization of their states, could we really say that the companies are looking after the people? I, I don't think so. And for anyone who may have a difference in opinion, I is more than welcome to come to know really. You know, I will host them and they can see for themselves who is exploiting who. But what about the election promise? The election promise of 1000 rupees. Now, what many people do not uh, comprehend is that whatever said and done, this is an employer-employee relationship between the RPCs and the tea pluckers who are the employees. And we are merely signatories for them in the collective agreement. Government cannot enforce, uh, you know, um, the wage hike and whatever when it comes to tea estate workers as they do, as they would do for teachers and other government mm -hmm. employees because the tea pluckers do not fall into the government employee category. But however, through successive collective agreements, you know, we had uh, considerably increased the salary of a tea estate worker. For example, in 2017, we received a 40% increase in the wage of a tea estate worker, which has never been done before. From, I think, about 500 rupees, we increased it to 750 rupees. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, that had never been done before in any other fields. And at the same time, now recently, uh, we had multiple series of discussions with the plantation companies. And they, to give them credit, they did give us a number where they were giving an all-inclusive thousand, which was uh, 700 rupees basic and 100 rupees price share supplement, 100 rupees attendance incentive and 100 rupees productivity incentive, which comes up to 1000 rupees. But there was no real increase in the basic wage. And we can't really call it a, you know, a wage increase without increasing the basic. You mm -hmm. can't just increase the incentives and say it's a wage increase. So we, you know, opposed that. And when it came to a standstill, we had to force it through the wages board. And through the wages board, we received a government gazette for 1000 rupees. And the government, as a government, we have completed our promise to give the 1000. However, the companies following the decision had gone to courts and they had filed an appeal and you know right after that in the in certain acts of vengeance where they believe they are taking uh, vengeance on me they have started to exploit the workers and treat and mistreat them more than what they were doing earlier now to put it in perspective i may you know um, a worker when they work for eight hours a day they are entitled to thousand rupees but what the people who are not you know who are on the urban side do not know that these um, what these RPCs do is that they don't pay the full thousand. If a worker plucks only 12 kilos or 13 kilos, they pay the worker 500 rupees and they call it half name. And that is illegal. And similarly, they have removed maternity benefit right after granting this thousand. The mm -hmm. companies have refused to pay maternity benefit. They've, uh, they've sacked many people and so many injustices are happening and now we have gone to courts as well. And uh, I think as time goes on, we will know. So to answer your question, as a government, we have given 1,000, but the companies are not acting in good faith and uh, they are not providing the people with their wage. So now we have to see how we can enforce it. But is there, is there any way that the government can intervene and in fact enforce this promise? So that is what we are doing right now. We are in a legal battle with the companies mm -hmm. and I can't comment on that further, but um, you know, we have the Attorney General's Department working mm -hmm. on it along with our lawyers as well. So, um, you know, recently there was, uh, I think the, the companies had requested for an inter interim order to quash the decision, but that failed. The um, court had uh, ruled it in favor of us. And now I think, you know, we're waiting for the final ruling.
And I did um, uh, watch one of your speeches in Parliament, um, I believe around two months ago, where you actually said that all governments which came into power neglected your community. Why do you feel like this? Because um, now here's the part of history, you know, uh, which has been, uh, well, ignored by many. Between the years of 1948, mm -hmm. now as you're aware, you know, we got independence. Mm -hmm. But when I say we got independence, the people living in Sri Lanka got independence, but the estate workers did not. And not just estate workers, any persons of Indian origin, which, you know, engulfed estate workers, their children who were not into plucking, and anyone from the informal sector who, you know, could trace their origin back to this plantation community, they were not given citizenship from 1948 till about 1977. So, while the remainder of the Sri Lankan community was experiencing all, you know, um, all their constitutional rights, we did not receive anything. We did not receive our healthcare benefits. We did not receive our right to education, right to ownership of land and many other things. Because 30 years, we were not considered citizens of this country. And right after that, from 1977 onwards, people thought, you know, we received our, our citizenship rights. Everything will be a cakewalk. Mm -hmm. But only in 2003 did we attain, you know, a 100% citizenship uh, right. Because uh, only in 2003 did all Indian origin Tamils get uh, citizenship. And this was under the government which my father was a minister of. So, you know, when we did get a delay in our rights, we were neglected. And following which any other government that came into place, we were lagging behind by 30 years. So that is what I had mentioned. And, and when you talk about lagging behind, I would like to move on to the next question where Sri Lanka is a blessed country and... There was a lot of hope for Sri Lanka after independence in 1948. And um, however, we haven't progressed as much as many other countries that actually looked up to Sri Lanka and took Sri Lanka as an example of how they would like to be. Where do you think we went wrong? I don't think we went wrong anywhere. I think the only reason that happened is completely because of the war. You know? But it's been 10 years. But here's the thing, the consequences of a war can be felt even today. In the North and East, there are more children, I believe, in orphanages than I would see in a school because that is the situation right now. Mm -hmm. You know, when we say development, development has to, you know, go forward to every citizen of Sri Lanka. Right. Regardless of them being Northern Tamils or Hill Country Tamils or Muslims or Burgers or Malays or Christians mm -hmm. or whoever, you know, it has to be equally distributed. And, um, you know, the war got over and in 2009. Sorry, I'm, if I may interrupt you. I do believe um, it needs to be distributed equal. Do you think that happens? No, I don't think it's happened at all. From, let's say, from not only from the time of, uh, you know, where the war ended, I think from independence, mm -hmm. I don't think it has been evenly distributed. And, you know, you can't blame one government or one individual over this negligence. It's a collective, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a collective responsibility. You know, um, for example, let me just put a small example out there. Now, even though the war got over 2009, 10 years ago, that is still relatively a short time for development. And I feel we have done the best we can in the past 10 years, as much as a island nation can. And um, if you look at the time period between the war, while the war was happening, there was absolutely zero development. Mm -hmm. And now if you look at the time period between 2009 to 2021, Jaffna, before 2009, uh, actually, I went there right after the war. And when we went and visited Jaffna, there were no roads, there was no water, there was no, you know, sanitation facilities. It was completely in ruins. And now Jaffna is open to the public. There's access to healthcare, access to education, you know. So it's a step-by-step -step process. You know, when a baby is born, a baby learns to crawl first. The baby doesn't, you know, a baby is not born and run. So it's one of those things. Right. Um, um, when we had the war for 30 years, um, the people in Sri Lanka, or rather Sri Lanka was divided internally. It's, it's been 10 or 11 years after the war ended, but yet many feel and are of the opinion that Sri Lanka is still internally divided, especially between the different communities. There are, sadly, there are some politicians and some religious leaders who often talk about um, getting votes or or rather they cater to a singular Buddhist majority uh, community in the Sri Lanka, therefore discriminating um, the minority communities in Sri Lanka. How do you feel about this? Well, as I mentioned in the starting of the interview, I feel Sri Lanka is evolving. You know, we are moving towards mm -hmm. a better future, but it is a lengthy process. And with that being said, you know, um, I do believe Sri Lanka is still internally divided. 
and the reason it's quite simple in my opinion both sides have lost you know um, casualties Absolutely. in war you know let it be i'm not going to say the sinhalese and the tamils i'm just going to say it as you know the the you know there were the rebels and then there were there was the government and both sides have lost people during the war and that history is stained you know and it's difficult for people to let go i'm sure growing up in sri lanka even um, the youth of my age there was a point of time where they couldn't step outside the house their childhood had been robbed as well same thing applies to the youth in north as well you know they had nothing to do with the war it's not their fault they were born and born in jaffna and you know so both sides had difficulties growing up which they couldn't let go of mm-hmm. both sides had witnessed bombings both sides had witnessed deaths murders and kidnappings and whatever so it is not something that can be let go you know it, it can't be just released in a in an instant but when i said sri lanka is evolving now the generation you know for a generation to change it takes 15 years so now you know we've crossed 10 years another 5 years i'm sure we'll be seeing a bright sri lanka as a young lawmaker how would you like to contribute towards a more united sri lanka well i always believe in the theory of country before god Mm-hmm. but i don't think many people can proudly say they're sri lankan you go out people say i'm sinhala buddhist i'm tamil mm-hmm. and even in tamils i'm i'm jaffna tamil i'm hill up country tamil i'm a muslim i'm a burger i'm a whatever but at the end of the day you need to have that feeling that i'm sri lankan mm-hmm. you know you see so many people taking pride in being sinhala buddhist sinhala buddhist or tamils or whatever but i don't see many people taking pride in being sri lankan but that again reflects on what i answered earlier you see the youth right now they want that total inclusive uh, you know inclu- uh, you know they want to include everyone you know the youth right now want that sri lankan identity more than anything else so like i said it's a slow process and how or what would you do differently in your political journey just a simple thing just look at my fellow man as a sri lankan and not as a you know a religious individual that's about it there would have been much you learned being around your father and um What was it like growing up with someone who's a leader in Sri Lanka and someone who represents your community? Growing up with a father figure who happens to be a leader of a community in Sri Lanka, it's I would say it was a very difficult childhood. Not only for me, I have, you know, two wonderful sisters and it was quite difficult for all of us because you know, we um, you know, people I I mean I must say this people in Sri Lanka you know they usually throw around the word nepotism and mm-hmm. you know it's easy for this easy for being the son of a minister and it's actually not that easy you know not just for me but for anyone for that matter and i'm not speaking from a position of privilege because um you know despite being the son of a cabinet minister we had a relatively normal childhood and i'm thankful for that because i feel the reason why i appeal to the people in my constituency and why i'm able to work is because at how simple we are you know we understand the difficulties faced by people and at the same time you know um, we never got to see our father as often you know he was always um, you know here helping out the community and uh, all those things so when we did get to spend time with him unfortunately we had only about 3 years and his demise took place so i would say it's a double edged sword Do you find um it's it's challenging to be a politician especially without your father because I'm I'm sure he would have been a great support to you. I said yeah he was a great support to me you know when I initially got into politics and uh, what I realized is when I came into politics there were many things that I wanted to change which you know uh, many seniors were not too happy with but it you know my father he stood by stood firm by me and you know we were able to bring a lot of progress mm-hmm. into our country where we were able to create jobs at the same time we were able to you know bring bring in a lot of modernized thinking into our country for example you know people in our country they were living under this false notion that building a house is development but that is not actual development you know it's it's economic development that we should be pursuing you should give people the opportunity to build a house right now you know it, many people are not aware of this fact but you know um, people who are living in our country do not have rights to land and this is something we've campaigned for people do not have rights to land there and how it works is if you work for the company you can live there mm-hmm. if you don't work for them you have to get out and that is completely inhuman so this is something that we are campaigning for and times like this to answer your question yes times like this i do miss my father who was of support right moving on to the final question um you're quite vocal about um animal welfare 
Um, how do you think Sri Lanka should go forward with regards to animal rights and animal welfare? I mean, this is actually, you know, it's, it's quite amusing to me because I personally believe, just to start off, I personally believe that, you know, when I say my culture, my heritage, I don't mean just my upcountry Tamil lineage or my upcountry Tamil culture and heritage. When I say my culture, my heritage, I mean it in, you know, in the perspective of a Sri Lankan. Buddhism is much as my culture as Hinduism. And mm -hmm. same way Islam, same way Christianity. I still go to pansalas, I still go to mosques. Not just for political reasons, it's, you know, just not to hurt the sentiments of others. And, you know, I have, and I am an avid reader. I love reading books and, you know, um, I've read a summary of the Mahavamsa as well. And, you know, in Buddhism, the beauty of Buddhism is that you don't hurt any other creature. You know, and we say that with so much pride. And even in Hinduism, we say it with so much pride. But it's, it's sad that we don't practice it. You know, um, and that, that's why I've been quite vocal about it. Because outside the parliament, like you said, you have religious leaders, you have so-and-so and whoever just vocally, you know, they're so vocal about, um, you know, how this race should be on top of this race, this country belongs to this person, that person, all that. But if they were to practice what they have been taught in their monastery or in their temple, animals would be living in a much better place right now. Is there, is there any message you'd like to leave uh, with, I mean, give to our audience? Well, the only message I would like to give to the audience, especially considering that, you know, you have a large number of youth following as well, is that, you know, I think, you know, instead of sitting and pointing fingers, saying the country is wrong because of this person and that person, we can take a step forward, you know, and make this country a better place one step at a time. You know, it, we don't have to be in the parliament. We don't have to be in positions of power. Mm -hmm. Every small act of kindness leads to a better Sri Lanka. So... That would be my message to your audience. And every individual has his or her own responsibility. Correct. Right. We have come to the end of this conversation. Um, I do hope you found it insightful. Uh, I truly enjoyed having this conversation. Thank you. Likewise. But we are not done yet. Um, now we will have the rapid fire round. So do stay tuned. <music> Favorite world leader? Nelson Mandela. Favorite Sri Lankan politician? Um, Lakshman Kadirpur. Hobby? Football and reading. Favorite song? Manakir <laughs> Madhya. Uh, favorite food? Favorite food, Kottu. Favorite travel destination? No, really. Who inspires you the most in life? My mother. What is at the top of your bucket list? Well, to open an elephant sanctuary. Tea or coffee? Tea. Uh, what is your best memory? My best memory. Oh my God, I realize these questions are much more difficult. I think this is the most difficult interview I've come to. <laughs> and I've been to a lot of difficult interviews. Wait. My best memory. Well, it's just a collection of memories. So I, I guess I'm spending my childhood in Nurel. Biggest challenge you faced in life? I'm living life post my father's demise. Movies or books? Books. We have come to the end of this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be back with another episode soon. Until then, do stay safe and take care.